and Distance Learning Week 2021. Uh, we are still waiting for participants to join and uh, we will then uh, start uh, this panel discussion. Uh, in the meantime, feel free to say hello in the chat and uh, tell us where are you from. Um, you can uh, tell us uh, also how the weather is like uh, in, uh, in your place um, from where you are attending this webinar. Welcome again to everyone. As I mentioned, this is the opening session of uh, Eden's European Online and Distance Learning Week, the sixth edition in 2021. And we are very happy to uh, host uh, this, uh, this whole event in partnership with Open Distance Learning Association in Australia, jointly with Flexible Learning Association of New Zealand and the United States Distance Learning Association. Uh, also, uh, we have a special contribute, contribution, webinar contribution by ICDE in this event. So you can see we are uh, working a lot on collaboration and cooperation. As I mentioned, feel free to uh, say hello in the chat and uh, introduce yourselves. Where are you from? From what institution? Uh, maybe you can tell us how the weather is like. And uh, then when we have the presentations, feel free to ask questions. Uh, using the Q&A uh, section and our uh, distinguished guests, speakers will, uh, will answer uh, those questions. As I mentioned, this is the opening session. So we are very honored to, uh, to, to start this uh, whole week until uh, the, the 10th of November. You have daily sessions uh, organized by Eden uh, and we encourage you to attend as many as possible. During uh, this panel, we propose a discussion about good practices of how to integrate digital education in higher education institutions. So uh, the, if, if we learn something from the past uh, uh, two years, we learned that uh, uh, knowing how to integrate and implement digital education is a must in uh, these periods, in these times, and those institutions who already knew how to do this were well prepared and uh, responded uh, better uh, in these times of uh, pandemic. I am happy to see that we have uh, people from many, many places. We have people from uh, uh, India, from Croatia, from Italy, from Romania, from Finland, Sweden, Spain, uh, Brazil, Greece, and many other countries. I'm sorry if I didn't mention all of it, all of you. Uh, and now I think uh, the introduction part is uh, enough. Um, my name is Vlad Mikhaescu. I always forget to introduce myself. I am the Eden NAP steering committee chair. Uh, and uh, Eden NAP is one of the entities, uh, governing bodies of Eden, and we uh, try to help and encourage collaboration uh, and a big community of uh, researchers uh, and didacticians uh, specialized in, uh, in uh, online learning. It is uh, my great uh, honor to introduce the first speaker of uh, today's uh, panel. Uh, this is Edmundo Tovar. He comes from the Technical University of Madrid, where he received the computer engineering degree and PhD uh, from, from, this uni from this institution. He is currently a professor of information technology in enterprise. He has served as an elected member of the board of directors of OpenCourseWare Consortium, executive director of the OpenCourseWare um, office of the Universidad Politecnica de Madrid, and executive director of the Open Education office in the same university. Currently, he is the president of IEEE Education Society, he leads the Universidad Politecnica de Madrid research group preferent in technologies applied to open education. And I am really looking forward to hearing his presentation. Edmundo, thank you for joining us and the floor is yours. Okay. Okay. Can you see the... My screen now. Yes, we can see if you start the the present the. Okay. Yes. It it will be. 
Okay. Thank you very much for your introduction. It's a real pleasure for, for me to participate in this conference, in this panel in particular, sharing uh, my experience with my colleagues, uh, Alfredo and Diana. Um, thank you for, the, for your invitation to participate here. Um, and my greetings to all the audience that uh, I realized that is very wide uh, in several geographical areas of the world. So thank you, everybody. So uh, my talk uh, will serve to introduce digital practice. Edmundo, I, I'm sorry to interrupt. Uh, maybe if, if you start present mode, we will see better if it's possible. Thank you, I'm sorry. Yes, okay. And you see better now? Because I think that if I put in a presentation mode, I think that is, there is problem with Zoom. Ah, okay. But you can see now to, with this size or not? Okay, we can, we can go with this, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, uh, my talk, uh, uh, is uh, will serve to introduce digital practices from my viewpoint as president of one professional organization as is uh, in IEEE Education Society. The recent need uh, shown from the pandemic by almost all the world's uh, higher education teaching staff to move towards remote instruction, find in university and professional associations the promoters in which to develop the new teaching learning models. My talk uh, as an introduction, uh, I will talk about uh, the current situation about uh, the, the digital transformation, specific, specifically in education, talking or making reference at the drivers and barriers for, for academic professional career, uh, the competences for educators, and the role that uh, a triple education society has uh, related to this area. I will introduce uh, briefly uh, the IEEE ecosystem to help the teachers that as consequence of the pandemic has emerged to facilitate a rapid transition from classes online environment around different dimensions of education for academic in, in universities. Let me firstly to introduce quickly uh, what is the education, the IEEE Education Society. Okay, you have here in, the, uh, in our website, uh, you have here uh, all the information that you can find related to our activities, uh, specifically about uh, obviously educational opportunities and other areas that uh, we have developed or we are working as journals, uh, standards, uh, conferences, etc. cetera. Um, it's only uh, the Education Society, I know a global overview, you can see that uh, was founded in 1957, is one for that reason, is one of the oldest technical societies. It's a community of professionals dedicated to ensuring high quality education in science and engineering and our objectives in some, as an international organization is the promotion, advances and disseminated state of the art, scientific information and resources related to the, our society's field of interest that is education and technologies and, and educational technologies. Uh, you have here a very good summary of our strategic plan. We are, uh, we have in all our areas, we have, uh, these are our main strategic goals in the standards divisions. We try to sponsor uh, and form virtual graduate study consortium, no limited time in space, only at a given conference uh, in publication division, we, we develop or we are working to, attra to attract solutions for disseminating and curate, uh, curating knowledge, enhance journal relevance, uh, about uh, conferences division to, to raise the recognition level of society flagship, flagship conference. We have four flagship conferences. Uh, about the journals, we have uh, Four, four journals. One of them is open, is 
is actually access. Uh, about membership to facilitate the creation and management of chapter to promote chapter best practices. But here we are, we are talking about uh, our education educational offer. So we will try to engage members through professional development activities, chapter activities, and other events, etc. Um, in education, so specifically in education, we have a, a strong webinar collaboration with IEEE Educational Activities Board, a distinguished lecture program, educational, uh, we are trying to promote and communicate our awards and our offers uh, through our chapters, conference, etc. So, but, uh, I would like to explain a little more about uh, the complex organization or the complex structure of IEEE. I say that one of the of our, of our strategy is to be aligned and collaborate with something uh, and unit that is called uh, Educational Activities Board. The Educational Activities Board is, a, is a one of the main units in the governance of IEEE in general that is in charge to uh, to of the development and delivery of continuing education products and activities. There is a business uh, area that has uh, several products and services as a main platform, and that is called uh, IEEE uh, Learning Networks with all our courses that uh, you can access by sub subscription through universities, etc. This is the business area of IEEE in educational matters, but so we are collaborating with this union in order to, to have more impact in our initiatives, in our, in our products and the services that we provide. <clears throat> okay, uh, going to the, to the core of this panel about the educational, uh, about digital practices in education. So the first, the beginning of my presentation is to say that uh, we are living, we are in the middle of the of the digital transformation of the society in general, but uh, not only the society and specifically in education. So <clears throat> the next one. So I, I will do, I, I will make a reference to a couple of uh, European technical reports. The first one is about is innovation, professional development in higher education. And uh, here we have identified several drivers for, for the growing need for, uh, for the career, for the professional career of the faculty in higher education. The first one is the massification of, of higher education, the massification because we are living in the last decades we are uh, we are living a high rise uh, of the enrollment of the student enrollments so simultaneously we have the students that that uh, adopting a new model uh, they are more active in their academic development and they engage in the co-production co of, of education that that they receive here we have a student center models of higher education and have emerged uh, where they are more frequently positioned as consumer and not only the partners of products. The another one, the another driver that we have is the digital transformation uh, of, high, of high, higher education, the importance of the digital technologies that we have and then uh, we can access in higher education in this moment. The process of creating a culture of digital transformation of education requires in the first place, the training of teachers in new ways of taking advantage of digital technologies that can help in the educational innovation. And there are uh, changes in the nature of professional competition because uh, the professional success is not only based in the academic performance, you know, but uh, it's important uh, to, to recognize that, uh, the, that uh, the, um, the professional career is based in our skills and the knowledge and the experience that we have. For instance, the educational 
practices has to be uh, focused on skills, competences, etc. So there are other, uh, I will talk about uh, now about the main obstacles to academic participation in continuous professional development. This is something that I have extracted from another European report. Is that uh, firstly, is that uh, the academics unwillingness uh, to move away from traditional teaching practices. This is something that, that we know obviously uh, just before of the, of the pandemic, but now uh, the faculty the faculty has very well reacted to the new challenges that we have. But in the past, uh, uh, the moment that uh, this report has been delivered, has been launched, the problem is that, uh, is that uh, the resistance to the change of the academics in particular. Another obstacle that uh, we have to to face is the lack of formal requirements of, or incentives for teaching developments and higher education institutions, the lack of time for the professional career aim on university staff, the lack of financial organizational and institutional capacity to develop effective professional career schemes at the higher education level. So, just before of the, of the pandemic, we can identify a, a low participation of academics in innovative, innovative projects, despite of the driver for a professional career in, high, in higher education. Okay, this is the context that uh, I, I think uh, related to the competences of educators in general. Just before of the of the pandemic, but uh, everybody is uh, everybody agrees that the pandemic has served as accelerator of changes to to improve and to overcome all these obstacles. So, as my viewpoint as professional. Uh, prof uh, professional association is to serve to our membership that is constituted by um, mainly by teachers in general is to focus on how which are the products and services that we are provide to our teachers in order to adapt to it, to to accelerate this digital transformation and to improve in the digital competences that they need to trans, uh, to use in the in the in the universities in which they are working okay so this is one of the references that, that we can take uh, talking about uh, educators competences this is the european digital competence framework for educators so there are several dimensions for educators, the professional, pedagogic, and learners' competences. <clears throat> okay, we are, we go quickly. Hmm. This is the DICCOM Edu framework, distinguish, distinguishes six different areas in which educators' digital competences is expressed with a total of 22 competences. So I will focus on the skills related to digital resources. According to this framework, the educators has to select digital resources. This is a problem of the discover or the to discovery of resources. They had to they have to create and modify digital resources and to manage and protect and protect and, and sharing digital resources. In this context, I would like to 
review the services that education society, that entrepreneurial education society is offering in, the, in that moment. Obviously, we we offer uh, a program of webinars. You have here a summary of the web, of the online events that we have organized for 2021. Many of them uh, are uh, organized with this unit of governance in IEEE that I explained before that is, education, is EAB, Educational Activities Board. Uh, we have talked about uh, resources for the university faculty as a then. No? So I think that this is one of the priorities that all the professional organizations have. I would like to, obviously we have our own program of educational products and services, for instance, about MOOCs. And I would like to highlight that uh, we are collaborating with other organizations, for instance, uh, with Merlot. This is an open repository uh, with, that supports 25 uh, different disciplines. We have an agreement with Merlot in order to, uh, to participate in the, in the editorial board of two of these disciplines in computer science and information technology. We have uh, collaborating with Merlot. With Merlot, uh, we have developed our teaching with technology resource center. This is only to host or to provide uh, links access to open educational resources. The uh, uh, the education. Society Teaching Resource Center respond to the current challenge lecture oriented instructor that need to use online instruction to address the teaching assignment. assessment. Uh, these are the structure of the kind of contents that this uh, center has uh, about uh, IEEE resources, Merlot specifically resources, other ones and how to participate uh, we use one of the social network of IEEE that is, that is called Collaborative. I would like to say that we are organizing in this moment, we have uh, an open call to participate in the second annual student OER contest that this is, uh, that we uh, organize in collaboration with the IEEE Computer Society in one of and the awards are delivered in the in one of the flagship conference of computer society that is Comsac. And I would like to focus more in our main product uh, that uh, can be useful for our teachers. That is actually teaching excellence hub. Okay, this is a collaboration again with the. IEEE Educational Activities Board. You have here who are the co-chairs. This is our, Steve is our Vice President of, of Educational Activities and by, and, and they are here participate and other uh, representatives of the staff of IEEE. Uh, the Teaching Excellence Hub is an open access website for those teaching engineering, computing and technology at the university level is oriented to our to teachers to, to help them to develop the professional development. Um, uh, it contains uh, curated content, including short articles, professional events and other resource collection. There will be, uh, okay, there will be uh, an online webinar about, uh, it's here, sorry, no, here. There will be uh, next Tuesday, uh, November 9th, uh, a webinar in order to explain uh, how the Teaching Excellence Hub is working. You have here the, the access and the way to register. So, uh, now uh, I was I, I was talking for twenty minutes. I think that is my time. I want to be 
I want to be um, strictly to meet the criteria of the length of my time. So uh, my vision is try to, to give you a global knowledge about uh, that in order to, be, to help in the development of the competences of educators in general, specifically for universities, uh, education society, my, my organization is helping in collaboration with other units, is helping uh, with several activities and broader focus in my presentation, focus on uh, repositories and resources for this topic. Thank you very much. This is my contribution at this moment. Thank you, Edmundo. Um, one short question um, um, before we move to, to our next speaker. If you can give us some example of how Politecnica of Madrid uh, managed uh, to get over in these times uh, and how they implemented uh, digital practices in, in the education. Yes, in my university, uh, there are, okay, we can distinguish between two different sites. One of, one of them is the, is the technical and infrastructure, infrastructure logistics in order to, to, uh, to provide uh, the different technologies to the community of educators. Uh, this is obviously we have to adapt uh, to a new environment with a blended audience on site uh, in person and virtual students. But in this moment in Spain, we are living a more relaxed uh, time for the restrictions to face to the pandemic. So in this moment, from the beginning of October, since the beginning of October, we retrieve the the teaching in person 100%. So we try to uh, to take over the habits of, of, of our students to come back to our installation. So we try to remove all the facilities that we provide to our students to attend to our classes in an online environment because we are not an online university. So the priority of our Rector 18 is that uh, uh, to recover all the practices in in person modality. Um, about the pedagogies, um, this is another side. Uh, we have an office of in, of educational in, in, in innovation in at the university that we have periodically uh, calls to present. Uh, educational projects in order to, in, to improve. And obviously in this moment, uh, after the pandemic, the call uh, try to attract proposals that joins the use of the new technologies with the new pedagogical models that we need to face to this, to this, to this time. No? <laughs> Thank you, Edmundo. This was very interesting. We will get back uh, to see if we have questions uh, in the end of the session from participants. Uh, and now it is uh, my pleasure to introduce the second speaker of uh, the day. Uh, my colleague from Polytechnica University of Timisoara, uh, Diana Andone. Uh, Diana is the director of the e-learning center of uh, our university. Uh, she is responsible for planning and implementing digital technologies, online learning technologies, and uh, also uh, uh, several platforms, award-winning platforms of our university, involved in several research projects uh, re in relation to uh, e-learning and digital culture and uh, everything which is related to uh, how to include digital, good digital practices into education. Uh, Diana was recently awarded the, the Distinguished Chapter Leadership Award by IEEE Education Society. And today she will uh, present us some uh, interesting uh, study cases of uh, uh, good practices in digital education. Diana, please, the floor is yours. Thank you very, very much for this. I hope you all can hear me very well. And I will go directly into the presentation mode. And uh, please let me know that you are seeing the right screen. Uh, just a small nod will be good yes. for me. Thank you so much for this. So 
practices in digital education for universities. And I will speak briefly about my university. Sorry for this, I apologize. I will try not to move too much the mouse. Uh, so I will speak briefly about my university in uh, Polytechnica University of Timisoara. Uh, but also something about the project in which we are involved and which luckily, believe it or not, the other two uh, speakers at this are also their universities part of. So this is why I selected exactly these two projects to introduce and to present something more. What we are doing in my university is part of what we call the digital education strategy of the university, which was uh, in fact uh, initiated about 12 years ago when we started with a full digitization of uh, different tools and of creating the support and also the skills of our educators and students towards uh, creating this uh, full digitization of the university. We obviously used the early adapters in towards that, and then we moved in the last three, four years towards the digitalization, when we try to create more of a digital education ecosystem and trying to create also students as co-creators of content and of uh, open educational resources. We consider ourselves that now we are trying to do as much as possible of the digital transformation, even if we are tr a very traditional technical university, a brick and mortar as it's called uh, university, which is just doing usually face-to-face -face education in a very traditional way with hands-on and practical approach and working closely with uh, the industry. We are trying to bring as much as possible of the academic culture change towards changing the uh, use of digital tools in education. So as I said, a part of digitization was building the university virtual campus and also the uni campus, which is the Romanian version of uh, open online courses which is supported uh, by my university and a lot of training. Our main focus, especially probably in the last seven, eight years was on training the staff and also the students. And this is what happened in one year in the pandemic education in Romania, in my university, sorry, in the technical university, we exploded completely in the creation of uh, resources and of materials. Uh, I will only drag this to you that we have more than 20,000 more new interactive resources created only in one year in our university and a lot of working tasks, uh, the same over 20,000 for a university which enrolls at this moment uh, only around 16 to 17,000 students, uh, which are all coming from fa traditional face-to-face -face normal uh, education and their undergrads and master students. What we have done also beside that is a lot of webinars, and I'm happy to see a lot of Romanians also into this uh, uh, webinar, which we follow somehow after Eden models uh, on online together. They're called the same, but they're done basically for the Romanian community of education. And we managed to have very successful attendance and interactivity. And we awarded also for the first time in Romania, some digital badges. We move then to digitalization, where we try to create this ecosystem. And I will briefly show what we have done and collaboration and co-creator and the virtual mobilities. So obviously what we have done towards this development of the, how to say, the open lifelong learning students, which is our main focus uh, since the last 11 years and of the entire digital education strategy was to use and to inter integrate as much as possible open educational resources and open online courses into the curricula to build up a full virtual campus around this idea. So not only like a LMS, like a learning management system, but as a virtual campus. And tomorrow my colleague, uh, Andre, uh, also who is the head of the virtual campus of the university will present the results more from a technical perspective and also the impact and the support which we gave to, to, our, uh, to our staff and students to focus a lot on virtual mobilities. And for that, we had several successful projects in the university, some for even more than 10 years and some only in the last five or four years and to move towards micro-credentials. And when I was speaking about open virtual mobility, 
we fo- we finalized uh, two years, uh, one year and a half, in fact, ago, the Open Virtual Mobility Project, which was uh, selected as a good uh, good example by the European Union, where we try to create a hub for uh, staff and students from higher education to learn how to build up uh, how to build up a, a virtual mobility. So there are 24 courses which you still can find for free. Uh, for about getting ready for virtual mobilities, and I will encourage you to do that. And then the end, you will be able to receive a badge. So we introduce the open credentials to recognize the skills. So you will be able to apply further easier to the Erasmus new scheme of uh, shorter or even longer virtual mobilities, which was introduced in the last year. Another successful project which helped us on on how to say, um, creating this ecosystem in my university was ABC to VLE, uh, led by the University College London. Probably this is a very famous method of uh, learning design, the ABC to learn to LD learning b- design based on Diana Lorillard's uh, principles at the beginning, where you use a lot of tools and a lot of integration uh, towards all the, the, the six main sections on learning, like acquisition, collaboration, discussion, investigation, practice, and production. And to all of them, you create also a scenario and a learning path uh, and a a map to create that. We integrated a lot of resources and tutorials to support those tools, part of the tools, not all of them. And we call them the guide and the diagram of ABC to VLE, which is available in Romanian and in other 18 languages. I mean, the method, so you can find it also on the ABC to VLE website. We move then to the digital transformation. And here we have quite an innovative project to which we are working now, uh, part of the EPSI, which is the European Blockchain Service Infrastructure, where my university and my colleagues are working very much on building up uh, um, the, the full not to say diploma validation and recognition from the Romanian universities into EPSI, so using uh, blockchain infrastructure and blockchain uh, system. So the digital credentials will be as valid as the physical credential. So to validate uh, easy and uh, worldwide the diplomas gained from European, from Romanian university. At this moment, we already tested, in fact, yesterday, the first two diplomas, how they are working with EPSI, so jointly with our European Union project partners, which are all coming from each country, is only one uh, partner. So um, in Romania, it's us uh, together with the National uh, uh, Comp- uh, Nas- National Council for Higher Education. The other bit which I want to focus on is the students as co-creators, because that's quite important. Uh, you need to be able to encourage the students to be part of the learning system and we've done this extensively in my university and not only in the last year as you can see also physically uh, but uh, quite strengthly in the last year when students created either resources directly for um, uh, labs and for educational resources which were reused uh, a year later with the new new cohorts or with the industry so real practical examples which you can uh, use and then deliver to the industry and to the community A project in which we are now uh, working, which is trying to change the curriculum design to use the MOOC-based innovative instructional approach uh, to uh, integrate them in higher education. It's called Moda IT. And uh, we are a lot of partners here. And here, as I said, it's Politecnica di Porto, uh, from where Alfredo is coming, uh, is also partner, is led by the Fachhochschule uh, Mittelstands from Germany, Kaunas University of Technology, Anadolu University and us. And it's called Moda IT and please find out uh, a lot of information about this uh, also. The Moda IT, as I said, it's focusing more on curriculum. So if the others were focusing more on skills and abilities and trying to build up also forms of accreditation or, uh, or credentials, there is more focusing on curriculum. So you need to think how you are changing the higher education um, infrastructure and higher education instructors and educators uh, awareness and skills towards adapting to more flexible and uh, um, open methods. Today in another meeting, I heard the new term like high flex, which is coming from hybrid and flexible. So how you make 
hybrid education and flexible education more popular. And here is uh, some of the ideas from that. What we are doing into this project, we are looking first at an online self-assessment tool. So every educator can take that and then evaluate themselves on where they stand towards uh, the 27 competencies which we defined for this. We designed and we run already the first, the first part of the online training for MOOC uh, um, training the educators. We are now in the middle of uh, developing the, a new uh, curricula for several courses and then obviously uh, the, the ambit of, about implementing that curricula. Online self-assessment tool, the process was quite easy. Obviously, we done first the selection of the competencies, then we look at the focus groups, we done a consolidation and we run the piloting. And these are the, 20, as I said, the principles and the 27 pedagogical and technical competencies were split into five areas. They were looking at pedagogical competencies for designing student-centered learning, then MOOC-specific ones, which are especially about learner motivation and how to assess and work with groups, technology-related competencies about learning analytics and communication, then obviously about independent learning and the openness, and then how to integrate peers uh, into evaluation and assessment and how to do that into formal learning. We done the piloting. We had several hundreds of answers to the self-assessment uh, tool in the pilot phase. And here you can see some of the evaluation from the self-assessment tool, which shows quite clearly that quite a lot of them agreed that the competencies usually uh, and those 27 competencies which we identify, which are also strongly related with the digital competencies from European Union for educators, those that related to educators. And we looked also at how selfie was designed for school educators. Um, so we quite got uh, good results on that perspective. And also we are moved then um, in the spring of this year to uh, deliver and uh, obviously first to create and then to deliver the open online training program dedicated to educators which was uh, um, already run and delivered. And it was based on five learning modules, foundation of online learning, MOOC course design, MOOC content production, delivery and MOOC informal learners. Each of the partners delivered one module and uh, the module were um, based on uh, videos and text and a lot of activities as interactive as it was possible. And uh, we used Moodle environment to deliver it. Uh, we had 125 uh, participants coming from partner universities. So this was the available only for partner universities in this pilot mode. We are now seeking how to open this uh, online training mo uh, program for the other, uh, I mean, for the community of educators, at least in Europe, if not worldwide, and also was evaluated on how the new skills of the higher education uh, were uh, were achieved or not towards that part. We are now in the process of, uh, we selected 20 professors and courses which need to adapt and change their curricula and their curriculum design uh, 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 as it was learned or trained part of the uh, modality uh, training program. And we try to see how that is going to be run into formal education, where it's not that easy, as you know, to uh, change and adapt the curriculum. The other project, uh, which we are also focusing, it's a new project, uh, which started almost eight, eight months ago, is Akadija, which is augmented teaching through blended learning. And this puts digital into academia, sorry. And again, University of Porto, but also Politecnica de Madrid from where Edmundo is coming, uh, are part of this consortium. And we are working with Universitat uh, Politecnica del Marque, with National Technical University of Athens, with Trinity College Dublin and with Innova, which is uh, supporting us uh, as, uh, as a company uh, working with digital uh, tools and digitalization. What we are planning to do there, sorry, is obviously to foster the synergies from the six countries and to try to learn from the experiences of the past two years in uh, almost two years in online learning and in hybrid education for some. 
and accelerate the readiness of these polytechnic uni technical universities uh, towards the adapting of uh, digital uh, tools and digital resources, and also to create the uh, availability of the tools for the educators. Obviously, we have some intellectual outputs. The first one is a compendium of augmented blended teaching, which we have uh, just recently finished or almost finished, and we are now uh, validating and evaluating. We are preparing now for training the mentors because this is believing quite a lot on ambassadors, on early adapters, which are the mentors of their colleagues and of the students to how to use digital uh, tools and digital methods in uh, higher education, in technical universities. And obviously at the end, trying to send this uh, towards uh, the others and try to implement this at large scale, at least in our university. As I said, we have done national reports and analyze of how technical universities in our countries have been looking and working and trying to reinvent and rethink their role in, um, in this period of uh, online education or remote teaching or call it as you want, and how all of those have changed the pedagogy and also the use of technology in education. Uh, we, are, we have also analyzed some of the tools and we, which, for which we created a, a validation and we will integrate them into the support and training because based on the evaluation at national level, those were the tools which were most used by everybody in the technical university. So based on all of those, our final target in uh, all the practices in higher education, uh, probably in the entire Europe, uh, is to how to create the open lifelong learning student, which besides of having the future skills and the 21st century skills and the digital competencies, they will need to learn independently. And they will need to be self-contained and resilient. And how you will be able to do that is probably not easy. And all of these tools and uh, projects and uh, structures and support, which I try to indicate to you, will probably help that. I need to thank my team. Everything which we do as we speak about practices in digital education is with my team, uh, which uh, I'm always only the top of the iceberg. Uh, and beside me, there are a lot of them. And uh, thank you very much. And please contact me if you need anything anymore. Thank you. Thank you, Diana, for this thorough presentation. We have seen several uh, examples of good practice, uh, both inside the university and also in the consortiums uh, and projects uh, our university is a part of. There are several questions in the Q&A for you. Uh, I will um, um, keep some of them for the end, but I would, want, I would like you to answer one of uh, the most interesting, in my opinion. So uh, from uh, Lai from KU Leuven, he is asking if you can tell a little bit more about how the university is training, developing the students' ability to, to be co-creators um, in the digital education. That's a, this, that's a very difficult question, if I can say, and it's not an easy one to answer very quickly and very directly. Uh, basically, because um, we, in fact, we, we have a paper and I'll try to find it and, and indicate it to you about that. So we basically, we trained them first. We created also a sort of short guide on what, what sort of methods and tools they need to use to be able to, um, to somehow, I have to say, um, uh, move towards creators, where we look at tools, we look at the principles, and also we invest quite a lot on... Um, on showcasing to them and encouraging them to use open educational uh, licenses, creative commons licenses to, to put that up. And then we train also some of the professors on how to encourage that and how to in incorporate that into their activities. Because one thing is very important to say this, when students are doing this, they need to get a grade for that. <laughs> and uh, so it needs to be clearly integrated into their activity. We've been able to do this in uh, four different methods. Uh, the most common one is project-based. So they will have a topic uh, for which they will need to work in teams or alone and to create a, a project theme or a project structure and to integrate that. Some of the others have been uh, activity-based. So there it will be an activity in a lab or an activity about a, a tool or a big activity about an industry which they will do for which they will need to do the research. And then sometimes they will even record the video 
uh, about uh, lab activity or uh, lab testing and then uh, add explanation and create some interactivity using different tools which we uh, we gave through the university also with the tutorials for how to use them and then publish them. Some of the others have been focusing on their, um, how to say, um, co-creation on the things which came from industry. And this is a long-standing thing which we do in my university, even when I was a student many, many years ago. Uh, a lot of the projects which I was doing in the final years, not only the final project, were small projects directly coming from industries, which they will like us to research and test and validate. And a lot of those, after that, they become uh, somehow presented as uh, what you learned, what was good, what was bad, and they are incorporated into the education part of that course of subject on how to run, run a project with industry. And obviously, there are many others like innovation labs and so on, which we are uh, doing uh, recently. It's not easy, but you, with encouragement and not, I, that's, that's my final idea. Don't imagine that this is happening everywhere in my university. I keep calling these are pockets of innovation, but they are the early adapters and the ambassadors, which after that create a change because uh, a lot of people follow them after that. It's an ambition to be the best or better than your colleague or uh, than the previous generation and then it's happening. Thank you, and let's hope that uh, this uh, uh, pockets will grow and uh, they will uh, encompass the whole university. Uh, we will get back uh, with the questions at the end of the session. Uh, thank you for your presentation. And now uh, allow me to move uh, to the final panelist of uh, today's session, uh, Alfredo Soeiro from uh, University of Porto in Portugal. Uh, he uh, holds the degrees in civil engineering uh, at University of Porto and the uh, University of Florida, um, where he has his doctorate. He is a prorector of the University of Porto, past president of EACE, AUPEC, uh, CEFI, and several other uh, organizations. He's also a colleague uh, with me in the Eden Executive Committee and in the Eden Map uh, Steering Committee with uh, a lot of experience in uh, uh, e-learning, uh, uh, specifically on assessment of uh, competencies, uh, construction management, and the use of digital tools. It is my great pleasure to uh, introduce to you Alfredo. Alfredo, please, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, uh, everyone, Vlad and my um, colleagues in the panel, uh, and all the participants. It's good to see 86 people uh, uh, listening to, to what uh, my colleagues had said, I'll try to, to keep up with the, with the level, but uh, bear in mind that I, I, I decided to talk about uh, something that is very um, dear to me, very important to me, which is the assessment of, uh, of the effectiveness of the teaching that we are all talking about. Because um, assessment is uh, uh, and you're going to see in my uh, presentation, is, is key for, uh, how do I say, for uh, everyone, uh, specifically the learners. And um, it, in fact, we, we cannot, um, I'm trying to share the screen just for a moment. In fact, what happens is that um, um, when we uh, try to, uh, let me show you the PowerPoint, here it is. Um, when we try to uh, verify if uh, what we are doing is, um, uh, is really an excellent uh, choice in terms of uh, choice of methods and techniques and, and et cetera, we need to know if the learners learn. And uh, uh, we may have a lot of faith in what we are uh, choosing and proposing, but uh, if we don't verify if the learners learn, then um, maybe we are not so uh, successful. So uh, my, my uh, presentation is a little bit uh, different from the others. If you want to know what happens in my university, uh, it, it's very simple. We had already a, a supporting e-learning unit for many years since uh, when I was a pro-rector. 
And what they did is that they had extra work. With the pandemic, they, they were submerged with, with requests from teachers and from departments and from faculties. And um, it, it was very difficult for them, but they were prepared because they had been done doing that for a long time. So they continued to do their training courses recorded and they produced a lot of webinars for training the staff, uh, helping them to uh, uh, surpass this, uh, this request for digital education during the pandemic. Um, currently, things like Edmundo has mentioned in Vienna also, things are going back to normal and uh, a lot of presential teaching uh, is being done. So some of the colleagues have abandoned uh, their practices online. So I chose to talk about assessment and uh, because uh, wh what we're going to do uh, is basically, uh, we are talking about micro-credentials and uh, other things, but if you don't verify if the micro-credentials are uh, good enough, they, they don't have uh, respect by, by the others, by the partners in society. So we need to evaluate the learning outcomes of the micro credentials and other, and other courses, MOOCs, et cetera. So that's what I'm gonna talk about a little bit. Um, this is the structure of my presentation. And uh, le let me bring to you um, a definition of assessment uh, that uh, uh, derives from uh, the Latin word that means to sit with, uh, where we probably uh, should be working more with the student to assess their learning outcomes than uh, doing, um, uh, how do I say, um, uh, assessments and evaluations that are not personal. And that's um, something that, um, uh, this idea to sit with the student comes from. Uh, I remember uh, I had a teacher when I was 10 years old. That's what he used to do. He used to sit with us in our, in our chairs, in our student chairs, and talk with us about uh, things and uh, what have we learned about this. Uh, let me tell you a story that was even a, uh, uh, for one of my colleagues. Uh, he asked uh, which... Uh, uh, plate he liked most, and he, he, when he was sitting and asked, "Well, if you if you get these uh, questions right, I'll I'll tell your mother to give you this plate next uh, next uh, lunch." So these are the things that uh, probably we are forgetting with uh, with uh, with uh, online learning that we probably have to work more with the students to know what they know uh, and um, to guarantee that's. Uh, uh, embedded in the reasons students want success, the teachers want compliance with their learning outcomes, and society wants quality assurance. So that's why it's so important. Um, one of the projects uh, that I've uh, been involved in, and uh, uh, it's available on the web, the tool, it's tried to find the right assessments for the different type of learning outcomes. And this alignment is not easy. Uh, and the tool is, is just uh, presenting suggestions. This is not um, a simple problem. Uh, we, we generally make uh, exams and assessments based on, on uh, knowledge, uh, sometimes on skills, but very little on attitudes, for instance. And we have to find assessment methods for attitudes. I'm an engineer. I teach engineers. I, I want uh, professional attitudes as an engineer. This is the tool. This is a print screen of the tool where uh, the, the, the title is precisely uh, ask for assessment advice. Uh, which assessment you should choose for each type of learning outcome. You write the learning outcome and you, you find suggestions. This is one example of a project I've been involved also uh, to define um, um, uh, assessment modes for the different type of learning outcomes. This is a qualification framework uh, for uh, engineers. Uh, the dimension is knowledge and understanding. And you can find the, the proposals uh, from the tool uh, in the bottom of the, of the page and that exists for all the uh, competences of this uh, qualification framework. Um, 
There, there are other experience on this question of assessment. Um, I have here uh, one based on e-portfolio. Uh, there are many people researching the use of e-portfolios to assess the learning and to uh, mentor and adjust the teaching in accordance with the needs uh, from the students. Um, uh, I don't think I have the time to show you the web page, but uh, here you have the link if you want to take a look. Another one which I found very interesting was uh, uh, the effort that Eden has done to, to, to face uh, the challenges of the pandemic. And one of them was precisely on design and management assessments for online learning. There are other webinars related to the topic, but I just brought this because um, I think it's uh, relatively important to see uh, which research and practices are done on this question of assessment in the different uh, environments. Another uh, uh, aspect that I, I want to, to mention about the future is this question of um, uh, introducing, uh, uh, in this case, facial recognition. This is something that is already happening uh, for some years in, in, in some schools, some, some experiences in China and uh, with the University of Stanford, they are working with Stanford also on this, uh, on this tool that identifies the, 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 the emotions uh, using facial recognition so they can adjust uh, their teaching in accordance with the reactions that may be uh, positive or negative, but uh, it is somehow uh, something that I do uh, personally is when I look at the faces of the students, I think I can understand if they uh, are listening, if they are understanding, if they have questions, etc. So this is done artificially and that may be a big change for many classrooms. Another, um, another aspect that I would like to mention in terms of uh, assessment is the question of using artificial intelligence. Uh, there is a blog by this uh, uh, Bernard Marr that you can uh, that you can consult to see real uh, examples of uh, pick of the and pick uh, take a look at uh, at the future, and uh, this is one company uh, that it's already providing uh, with a tech uh, uh, cooperation that it's all employing artificial intelligence not to evaluate the students, but to help them uh, mentoring and um, uh, individualizing their learning as a function of their answers to, to, to the homeworks or whatever uh, assessment uh, mode is done. So this is also probably an interesting aspect. And I'm coming to the end of my presentation. I think that um, this question of assessment uh, is probably facilitated by uh, the materials and, uh, and the tools that we have now available, all the technologies. Um, I think it can be uh, universal, so we can work with anyone, is accessible to everyone, and it facilitates dialogue. I think uh, uh, one of the things during the pandemic was that I uh, managed to talk with each one of my students um, in a pretty deep way. So but this is a personal experience, of course, but I, I think it's possible. And I've seen examples of that happening. Um, of course, the information is uh, uh, now available and uh, can be uh, made um, useful for, for, for learning. And the most important part is this personalization of the, the assessment. And of course, teaching is also should be personalized. But um, the assessment, I think it's more important because uh, we are all different. We have different learning styles and different behaviors. And um, we, we should try to adjust our assessments to each one. And this is my uh, last slide, um, uh, addressing a little bit what was the topic of this panel. Um, we are assisting to this Uber learning. Uh, you, you learn. Uh, how you want and when you want, and just specifically what you need. This is something that will happen more in the future. Um, we will have a pulverization of uh, learning materials, uh, these uh, nano modules, micro modules, uh, 
and also the MOOCs, which are neither of those, but <laughs> they also exist. But in any case, um, we will have a diversity of, of options. But uh, the, the, the point that I want to make uh, that I think you, we could reflect is that probably uh, the future of university and teachers should be the accreditation and validation. We, we will be probably accrediting and validating competencies and uh, learning outcomes acquired by participants. But we will do uh, uh, more and more of this uh, activity. We will probably, we will also be involved in a lot of guidance for learners. We will probably not teach as much as we are doing it right now, but we will guide them to, to, to so they can learn. Uh, we can, will mentor, uh, Diana mentioned that uh, the mentoring, uh, I, I, I worked in a project some years ago about the creation of a professional uh, in education, which was the facilitator. Uh, they, they were not teachers, they were not uh, uh, learners, they were not technicians, they would just facilitate uh, the learning with the materials and the, 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 the professor in charge. So it was an interesting project with an interesting idea. Probably that will happen. Um, my, my collection is that I was in a company that had 6 million learners, online learners, 6 million, six million you can imagine in which country. And he had about uh, 900 uh, staff. One third of the staff was uh, marketing staff. Another third was the production. And the other third were the facilitators, were the ones that uh, were after each student and working with them so they will not uh, fail, they will not quit. So bear in mind that's probably something that will exist more and more at universities. And finally, um, I think education, as it is, uh, will become a commodity. I, I, I'm sure that um, uh, although some of us consider it as a social good, it is more and more an economic good. And uh, that's it. Thank you very much. And that's the end of my presentation. Thank you so much, Alfredo. Uh, very valuable information uh, you shared today with us. Uh, there are a couple of questions for you in the Q&A section, and I would like for, for, to, ask, to ask one of them uh, now. It's from Alastair Pilman, our colleague. So if we use commercial AI applications with students, how do we guarantee that those companies do not mine and exploit the student data? This is a question I have uh, also heard uh, uh, in uh, several discussions, especially about uh, proctoring. Uh, in e assessment. So, what's your opinion on this, Alfredo? Well, we, we have to see the contracts. I, I had uh, in the past contracts that were not uh, ethically acceptable. So, I read them and I said, no, you cannot use it. But uh, the, the point of uh, using student data uh, can also be, uh, how do I say, anonymous. You, 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 can, uh, you can supply data that is anonymous. Uh, uh, let, let me let me tell you also another story. I'm old, so I, I have some stories to tell. Uh, well, I was once in a conference uh, in Stanford with one of the founders of Coursera, Andrew McGill, and uh, he was mentioning what Coursera was, what they did, how they started, etc., etc., etc. And one of the persons in the audience, uh, this was in 2016. One of the persons in the audience asked. Um, so uh, what's your business model? Why do you put those courses online for free, et cetera, et cetera? And he said, information. <laughs> we, we have about uh, five terabytes of information each day. And this was in 2016. And that's our business model because they sell the information. But of course, we, as responsible for the student, we have to be careful in, in keeping, uh, let's say, the data anonymous as much as possible. But... There's data in terms of, for instance, how many times you look at the slide in Coursera. That was the research of Dillenburg in, in Lausanne. He had PhD student, how students, uh, PhD students work on how students were behaving in a Coursera module. You know, how, many, how much time they were spending on each page, et cetera, et cetera. So those things can be anonymous or not. It depends on what you are doing. Of course, we have to be careful. I agree with Alistair uh, that we have to keep it as uh, confidential as possible, as, 
and personal. Let's let's put it this way and personal. Thank you uh, for this opinion. Uh, I know this is one of the main reasons why many universities are resistant uh, in uh, in partnering with the uh, proctoring companies. Um, we we now uh, reach the Q and A section of uh, of this session, and we still have time uh, for questions. Uh, and uh, there were several uh, related to quality, and this will be my first question to the three of you. So, in in these past uh, two years, uh, there were tons of material uh, built, tons of resources, educational resources created specifically uh, for online education. And there are questions about how do we ensure the quality of these resources? What types of frameworks should we uh, use? And I am asking you uh, now um, if uh, you have already such uh, types of frameworks and methodologies in your universities or you are aware of such uh, methodologies of good practices of, of assuring quality. Uh, and I will start with uh, Edmundo, if, uh, if you please. Thank you very much, Vlad. Um, yes, I would like to answer to your question, obviously, but uh, I would like to, to extend a little more about my contribution because I think that I don't meet all the criteria, all the expectation that all the participants have about this panel because I focus more in a professional association, in the role to to help to develop new practices, new digital practices for, for the university. So I would like to talk, to resume very briefly which kind of project uh, I am working now in this moment. But about your question, about your question that is how to ensure the quality of the material. So I think that uh, obviously the orientation of for uh, to manage this kind of problem is to uh, to make uh, efforts in order to curate uh, all these materials. So obviously, if we are focusing in a, in a close environment, like a master university, for instance, about the entrepreneurship and innovation, there is a team of experts that review all the materials that after they were offering to the to the students. But this is a close environment. I think that we have more ambitious and if we want to, to use open resources that you can find in other repositories, uh, you, uh, you have to access to, to um, uh, with repositories with, rep uh, with confidence in order that uh, this is the case that we, we were looking for in our, in our association that uh, obviously we have to, to look for partnerships with other um, organizations that provide open repositories with very high quality materials. So I think that we, uh, we have these uh, both uh, approaches, no? in more in a close environment, but if you want to be uh, more ambitious or only please go to the with reputation repositories that with uh, confident uh, partners that uh, organize, that host this kind of resources. Okay, this is my question, my my answer to the question. But if you let me, at the end of the of the panel, when when any moment, only two minutes, in only to resume uh, my pro the project that I uh, that my group is involved uh, in my university. So I think that I can help. I can support the, the objectives of this panel. Sure, and I, I will be happy to do so. Uh, just uh, we finish this question, and then uh, then uh, I will give you those minutes to to present your current work. Thank so you. about uh, thank you, Edmundo, for your answer. Um, I agree that uh, repositories are uh, um, a solution in 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 some uh, in some sorts. Uh, Diana, uh, I saw that you already answered in, in writing, uh, but if you can briefly uh, answer this also uh, orally, please. Uh, yes, I think uh, it's quite important to look at repositories and to create repositories at international level. And probably one of the things which um, uh, the new digital education hub uh, which the European Commission is building is exactly this. 
In fact, to be honest, um, I'm a strong advocate of open education uh, practices and tools, and especially in terms of software, because I keep saying you can have a practice of open education and at core to believe strongly into that. But if the tools which you are using in every day or also in your university or in education, they are proprietary tools, uh, what is the model which you will give to the students? What the students will learn? How you can encourage uh, practices of open education and then give them uh, to work in tools which are only based on that? So this is why I kept hoping that, for example, Moodle, which initiated about three years ago to create uh, the Moodle Net, which would, was the plan exactly this, to give you an interface, an open source and free interface worldwide, if it's possible, where you can easily put, uh, open, I mean, any resource or guide or things which you have, and or at least even a link to that, uh, tag it and then create it available for everybody. Unfortunately, it's still not available. It's not an easy task to do that. And uh, something like Open uh, OA Commons, for example, it's doing it. But the digital education hub probably will do that, at least in, in Europe, hopefully. It was just launched uh, as an idea and probably uh, it was going to be built up. I strongly believe that beside um, all of these, you know, great projects, especially in European Union, on which we are part of, um, beside the normal dissemination or uh, awareness raising, which we are doing, if we will be able to find them in an easier interface or platform than the Erasmus Plus results platform, uh, everybody's life in Europe uh, education system would have been much more easier in the last uh, one year and a half and probably also in the future. Thank you, Diana. Uh, quality is always a difficult uh, topic to, to discuss especially since uh, depending on uh, the university and the country, we define quality in uh, different ways. Uh, yes, Alfredo, uh, if you can also jump in in this uh, topic, yeah. uh, how do we evaluate <laughs> Again, what, what quality framework should we use? <laughs> Again, with, with a story. Um, <laughs> in, in the end of the 90s, um, we had a project on quality of open and distance learning. and. Um, uh, we were in Budapest in a meeting, and uh, one of the partners was Jeff van den Braden. I don't know if you know him, but he was from the Catholic of Leuven. And um, he arrived at the meeting. I, I remember we were outside, and he came with about uh, 10 publications. And he put the 10 publications on top of the table and said, these are all manuals on quality of open and distance learning. I don't want to do one again uh, like this, because... There are many. There are many studies on quality, what was called open and distance learning in those days, but um, it's now called e-learning, online learning, etc. But as, a, as, a, as a, my view on the question of quality, quality is that uh, the open education resources will have quality if they fit the purpose, if they really uh, make uh, people learn. And that, again, is what... I mentioned in my presentation, you have to do assessment. You have to verify if um, uh, they have quality, if they provide the learning outcomes, they say they will. So this is uh, my suggestion. Verify if they, they provide the learning outcomes and competences as announced. Thank you, uh, yeah, if, yes, please, please. Yeah. <laughs> if I can just quickly say something about all of this discussion about quality, I I certainly believe that having a, a, a sort of evaluation framework and everything which you need to validate, especially for something which you are using directly in uh, formal education or for competence validation in a degree, it's very important. But uh, I believe quite a lot. I'm I'm. Uh, how to say I'm a computer scientist, my origin, or something like that. I'm not an educator. So, but I strongly believe in the theories of connected pedagogies and collective wisdom. So if I, I strongly believe also in terms of our resources, which I answer to, to the question that if a hundred plus student use it and consider it useful, that's the quality evaluation which you need and which you want. If a framework and a standard is somehow respected, then 
you don't need to validate it too much or something like that because the market, the student, will will define if it's good or not and they will use it or not. And if they will use it and if they find anything anywhere which is useful for them, believe it. They will share it between them and they will use it even more probably than your own resources. It doesn't matter how much quality evaluation you have done to that. So I'm pretty sure I'm speaking a truth now, a very how to say painful truth sometimes that we need to leave also in the education field the students to decide and to choose what they're using and how they're using. Thank you for for this, uh, Diana. Um, I would like now to, as I promised, to to give uh, Edmundo a few minutes to to showcase uh, what he prepared. And then I still have one last question for, for the three of you in regards to the future. So Edmundo, please. Okay, thanks, thanks, Vlad. I think that uh, it takes only two, two minutes if you want. Uh, yes, uh, in the presentation I, present, I, I, uh, I show several tools in order to do practices. Obviously, if, if, um, if you have the opportunity to use a platform or a half of, of resources, you have the opportunity to promote to to develop practices with your students in order to do several things. No? For instance, I say I put as exam as example in my presentation a contest of OER. Obviously, you can organize several practices with your students in order to co-produce uh, resources, open resources that uh, can be reviewed by other people. Okay, I, about my personal experience, my current experience, uh, my current contribution that I can provide in this panel about my group uh, is the participation in several Erasmus Plus projects. So the first one is that can uh, I can have a global picture about the objectives of these projects. The first one could be the um, a project that is called Extensoft. Uh, okay, this is. Uh, this is a project that try to organize all the skills and all the competences about uh, soft skills. So, but oriented to several target groups, not only obviously with all the levels of, of qualifications, pre-university and vocational education trainings, uh, obviously higher higher education students. Uh, obviously, you will have to, we will have to develop micro training programs, micro credentials, as Alfredo said in other initiatives, etc. So, uh, and the uh, and the approach using open educational resources. So, we will have to catalog and to uh, evaluate the quality of the resources. Another one is a project that uh, try to create environment uh, awareness about uh, the use. The, about the creation of, of environment awareness towards plants and greenery, educating young people and the teachers using ecological learning spaces. This is another Erasmus Plus that is called uh, this pills. Uh, my institution in, in my university, we have uh, we have uh, institutional, we are in, uh, participation, participating in another Erasmus Plus project that is called ELISA. Elisa aims to transform European higher education while strengthening links between engineering and society, reinventing the European engineer concept, concept, making a real impact of society using the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development and the, and the SDGs, etc. I am personally, uh, my group is, is uh, participating, participating in it's in one of the communities that we have, that the institution has created as the entrepreneurship. Entrepreneurship in my institution is very key skills competence that I try to use, uh, uh, had to that is promoted uh, to use in all the studies program. So, and uh, about professionalism, I think that uh, this is another area that uh, we are participating and try to reduce the gap between the demands of the market and the and the uh, academic uh, learning outcomes that we can generate. Okay, this is a brief sum uh, summary. I don't want to take more time for this interesting panel, but I want to try to explain a little more to, about uh, our activities in my university. Thank you. Thank you, Edmundo. Uh, it's always uh, difficult uh, when we are involved in so many activities to decide which to, to present in, in, in 
one uh, discussion and I'm very happy that you showcase now uh, so many projects and I will uh, I am curious to learn more and we'll look after this uh, on on the web for them. I would like to uh, finish this uh, discussion with uh, with the last question. So what is the future bringing and uh, one of uh, one of the theories is that the future is hybrid. And now my question to you is the following. Have you designed or uh, do you know colleagues who designed a hybrid class and uh, um, how is uh, how is this uh, designed uh, uh, practically? How do you recommend uh, our uh, participants to design a hybrid class uh, in, in the near future? And uh, uh, now I will go to Alfredo since, uh, since we had uh, Edmundo just speaking and then I will come back uh, to you. Alfredo, about, please. About the hybrid. Yes. Yeah. Um, I mean, personally, I've, I've been doing that for 10 years or more. So uh, I've used the Moodle, we used uh, uh, Blackboard at the beginning and then Moodle. So it's been that for many years where I combine, uh, let's say, the interaction with the students virtually um, and uh, the, the, let's say the discussion and the presentation of the contents uh, uh, personally. So I think that the most important in the in the in the, the personal interaction that we cannot reproduce online is the um, is the, the the personal interaction looking in the eyes um, and understanding the emotions and the reactions that you cannot do online i've tried it i i did exams online <laughs> many years ago and uh, it's not the same thing you don't see the body you don't know if the student uh, is comfortable with the answer etc so I think that we we can do a lot online, but it's not the same thing as the physical interaction. And uh, I, I take advantage of all the digital support I can get. To be honest, uh, in my because the students um, have liked it. It's organized. It's 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 permanent. It's um, how do I say clear? Uh, even their answers when they write, they have to type it so you can read what they type and not and write it. So there are things that are good uh, physically present. There are things that are good uh, online. And I think we should uh, combine both as much as possible. I, I'm not a radical in favor of one or the other. I, I, I'm, I'm, I think we can combine uh, fruitfully the two options. Uh, thank you so much. That's that's also my opinion. Uh, a little bit uh, uh, of the both worlds, so to get the best of the both worlds, and uh, I think that's the way to go forward. Thank you, Alfredo. Diana, what is your input? Uh, uh, I I know for for a fact that you have designed the hybrid classes. Uh, I I have been together with you in them. So please. Uh, yes, I, I need to say that um, probably I've run hybrid classes even before the pandemic times, which uh, gave me a bit of experience. Vlad is very nice to remember that uh, when he was a student, also some years ago, I will not say so many, um, yeah, I used to, that was the first thing which I've done. I recorded uh, the audio and also the video of my class. So it doesn't matter what I was doing in the class. I mean, it's exactly in the class that was recorded and made available for the students. And maybe one anecdote also, which I know from Vlad, he used to listen to my classes uh, driving. So when he was uh, driving around the city or having different going around as a student, uh, he used to listen to my classes, which I consider personally um, not <laughs> not very very good for me. I kept saying that this will probably uh, he hated me in that moment, and, <laughs> and that's the way of doing it. So that's just a small anecdote for before. But going seriously now, um, we use um, so the method which I will recommend, or probably which is coming from my experience, is that. Try to use a lot of uh, pre-recording of the things which you can do. So if you really want to deliver strongly some message and some knowledge, re record them before. Record them uh, easily. Um, now it's not that difficult. Even in Zoom, either you do a presentation or a lab or anything, and then uh, you just record yourself explaining over that. Then use H5P or any interactive tool by adding even bookmarks or questions or anything there on that video and make it available in your learning management system for the students, either to see before or either to see uh, during the class and over the class. 
uh, because hybrid normally, and especially now in 2021, means not necessarily that you make available for the students some resources, but that you teach simultaneously sometimes in class and then off class. The thing which, for example, in our university we done as approach, even that we use that only for three weeks because we moved uh, after that again on full online teaching in my uh, university, as you probably are aware of the very bad situation with COVID now in the fourth wave in Romania, we've been hit more than in the previous three waves. And um, this is very unfortunate. So our university for a month almost now, three weeks and a half, is teaching fully online. But initially, also now and also in June, we use this hybrid method that uh, you will do the class, especially lab works with students in the lab, those which are there, you will record that uh, even sometimes by phone, by a simple phone installed in a, on a small tripod or something like that, and it will be recorded. And then you will use also the students to record small examples of the labs, and then you will put that together and available to the student. And then you repeat that class only online. And you are focusing only for the online students because we had students which were not able to come to the in-class meeting. So my experience and my suggestion is do not mix them in the same time if you really want to do a quality education in engineering mainly, especially in engineering. Uh, even that it's a duplicated time, our university pulled a lot of financial resources to that. So they paid a double time of the professors to allow uh, them to teach uh, the students which are physically exactly in the class and focusing on them with a recording which is then available for further evaluation and use and also by the online students and then to repeat that class and especially the labs for the online uh, students uh, using different methods and methodology. Thank you, Diana. Uh, when you say it like this, it sounds quite simple. Uh, <laughs> it's in, not. <laughs> in, in practice, uh, I can say uh, from, from my own example, it's not. But uh, uh, after you get uh, the use of it, um, it, it really gets, uh, it really begin, be, begins to be better and easy. Yeah. Thank you. You need, to have, you need to have a strong support unit and a lot of training. If you invest as a university in training your teachers and also your students, then you get uh, the results. Indeed. And um, we encourage all of you to, to talk with your uh, administration in your, in your universities to invest in, uh, in this uh, area. Edmundo, um, have you got any experience with the hybrid uh, design or what are your thoughts on this for the future? Yes, I think that uh, we are living, oh, we had experience in my university. All the teachers, all the educators have experience using hybrid model now because uh, there was a big effort in order to uh, to install in our rooms uh, cameras all the equipment needed to to this kind of model but uh, as as i said before i think that in my in our case in the technical university of madrid is a very presential modality is very the main feature is the modality is the presential modality uh, we are trying to go to come back as soon as possible to the in to the modality in person. So obviously all the experience that we have learned in the last month, that will be very useful in order to explore the new technologies and the new com digital competences as educators we have, obviously. But I think that, that we can address uh, all these competences for to attend the specific needs of groups that uh, require a specific uh, attendance or a specific attention. You know, that uh, people that is, uh, that uh, has problem to attend, uh, temporarily, temporarily has problem to attend to, to the classes, etc. So this is the direct uh, application that we are doing to, uh, to all the lessons that we have learned. Obviously, uh, we are in the process of the of the transformation digital of the digital transformation in our competences. They will be useful, but in this moment, I think that we will come back to a very distinction between online and uh, presencial universities. 
Thank you. And this uh, uh, process of, of the transformation, as we have also uh, uh, seen uh, in, in uh, I saw in the chat uh, some comments about the ne necessity of uh, well planning this. The, the comments were about the hybrid classes, but I can extend this uh, need of well planning for the uh, digital transformation, which we uh, are in the process of doing now in uh, our own universities. I thank uh, our uh, honorable and distinguished uh, speakers for attending and accepting uh, our invitation to, to be a part of uh, Eden's sixth European Online uh, and Distance Learning Week. Uh, I thank all the participants for your interest, your valuable input in the chat, uh, the questions. I'm sorry that we didn't get the time to answer all the questions. And uh, I remind you that we still have until the 10th of November uh, events organized by Eden. So um, be sure to register to, to all of them. Thank you, everyone, and have a nice day. Thank you, everyone. Bye.